Hi there, and welcome back to the channel. We hope everyone is having a great summer so far. Today, we will be taking you to see Lorraine's Garden, who was also in the fundraising event this year called Artists in the Garden. Enjoy. Today we are with Lorraine in her wonderful garden. Do you have a name for the garden that you had for the artists in the garden this year? Um, they just put Lorraine's garden. Oh, well, Lorraine's garden sounds fine to me. <laughs> Thank you. It's surely a labor of love for you then. Absolutely. Um, we moved in four years ago and it has been, that's when COVID happened. So in 2020, myself and just about every other person that was inclined that way was gardening. And so I just joined in. And you found things that worked and things that didn't work? Um, no, I just did my homework ahead of time. Um, so I figured out where the sun, sunny areas were, where the shaded areas were. And I placed my sunny, loving plants there. So no, no mistakes? No, because I didn't want to lose my investment. <laughs> and when you when you started with your gardening four years ago, did you have a seasonal budget or a budget at all, or you just went with what felt right? I went with what felt right, right. which is why it was important to me to know where I was placing my plants. Do you get a lot of flooding when it rains, like the big storm we had last week? No, interestingly enough, this space had, it came with like a 2% grade. <laughs> so I was very thankful for that and it set me up to um, just get on with it. Or you don't have to worry about flooding then? No. no and the soil was quite good, so we were lucky enough with that. You got some great art pieces here. Does she have a name? No, she does not.
pollinators of different kinds came to the plant and from that moment I realized that it gave the garden um, a life of its own and then I realized the, the, the influence of pollinators in really bringing, bringing the space to life and so I started to select plants that would cater to the well-being of pollinators and I learned a little more as I went along. And so eventually echinacea started to come here and all of your pollinator varieties. And the honeysuckle, which is in bloom, the other day I saw um, a hummingbird. I was going to ask. Yeah. That would bring in the hummingbirds. I, but they're so amazingly tiny. I thought, what's that very round bug? It's so tiny and so small. <laughs> when it went by the honeysuckle, I realized that I was thrilled. And what is fascinating about them is that um, the different flowers cater to the different mouth parts of the different pollinators. So you notice the honeysuckle flower has that elongated shape for the shape of the hummingbird's beak. Whereas something like um, catmint or even the echinacea purpurea would have, you know, a, a shape that's more conducive to the mouth parts of bumblebees and so forth. Nice. Yeah. And what other birds do you have coming to your garden? We have um, the, the cardinal, that's cardinalis cardinalis, and we have the American robin, Tudus migratorius. Now, there's a story about those two because I've been watching them or hearing the sounds for a number of years. And often you would hear a call from one and shortly after that, the other bird species would return the call and so I, I found that was happening over and over, day after day. And so I read up on it. And guess what I discovered? Yeah. They co-parent. Really? <laughs> They're co-parenting. And when you look at the population numbers, you realize how high they are. The success of both species is very high. And it's probably because of the, them getting along and co-parenting. So they're in constant communication, which is why one call follows another from two completely different species. There's something like 16 different calls for the cardinal. It's a, it's a large volume. Of, yes, sir. Yeah. That's quite right. There is. There is. Their mating call is completely different. But they, you know what has a very interesting mating call as well? The blue jays. Oh, we that's, had a pair in the spring right there loud. in that spruce. Yeah. yeah. It's like a squawk. Yes. The garden would not be what it is without the trees of the ravine mm -hmm. and the neighbor's own trees. It helps to add to the seclusion and privacy of the space. It also acts like a nice windbreak up there, so you're not getting the full bluster of the winds down here on your deck. No. And that's an, um, it's a sugar maple. So that's Acer saccharum. And many birds, insects, and squirrels all take residence up in that tree. 
But my absolute favorite tree is this ravine tree that leans into the garden, and that's a black maple. <laughs> so what does the color scheme look like in fall? Well, in fall, the star of the show is the this hair, um, this Japanese maple, blood good, absolutely bright red crimson to the point of when the sunlight goes through the leaves, it casts a pink glow onto the deck and the space. It's absolutely delightful. And that's my favorite thing, but also, again, that sugar maple, it has at least three color changes from the green to the yellow to the red. You can't see what's not to love. Wow. <laughs> I think this is a little magical place Thank we have you. here. Thank you, Claudia. It's so uh, warm and inviting and charming <laughs> at the same time. But I like the water. Yeah, well, you always like the water, but I love the trees, the height, the scale. Four years, the board view. <laughs> well, they talk. I let them do all the talking in the back yeah. I don't have much to say. I know. Nature. And they don't talk back. When you bought the house, did you, did you, did this make your mind up? Made you make your mind up? No, I was unaware with it. Of, what it would do and bring to my life. I, um, the ravine, I didn't see it at first and recognize what it could be. And then one day I, being meticulous, I climbed over the fence to tidy up some debris I had noticed in the back there. And I've been stewarding that ravine for three years now. I go in the back and I make sure it's tidy and whatnot. You can't even see invasive. it now in the middle of summer. No. In the middle of summer, wow. But um, that is gorgeous. That's absolutely, not too many of us. And even along this whole strip of the street, not too many of us have that opportunity to find a spot. I'm so glad the builders kept the nature behind the homes, That's very which is so amazing that they did that. They worked with the land and uh, that's a precious gift. You're quite right, Claudia. And what's important about that too, because you mentioned flooding area, is that the roots of the tree help to get the water going to the right places. And so we need a lot of natural vegetation to be preserved and respected for what and it is. And anchor everything in. And these Absolutely. trees are doing that too. Absolutely. Not to mention keep you cool. Absolutely. <laughs> and filter the air. And filter the <laughs> well, oxygen. And oxygen. That's right. That's I right. love the hydrangeas. They're absolutely beautiful.